came in from Mexico. So you've got an incredible opportunity to learn from one of the masters. He literally has written more books on NLP than anyone else on the planet. That says a lot about his expertise and his knowledge and what he knows and what you're going to be able to glean from this. Now he's taken the expertise he has with also a cognitive behavioral background and he's now put that to the work of humanistic psychology and Abraham Maslow and learning how to get to this higher level of self-actualization. So would you all help us to welcome your incredible speaker. This is on self-actualization. And that means you being everything you can be, the best version of you. Self-actualization, by definition, means that we're going to develop all the capacities, the skills, the potentials, so that your mental capacities and potentials, your emotional, your emotional potentials to connect, to care, to feel, to believe, to relate, your verbal linguistic potentials of all the use of language by which you can do so many things, your behavioral uh, potentials, your relationship potentials, becoming everything we can become, because when we can do that, then we'll have some peak experiences peak experiences. Maslow talked about that as being those special moments where you have that sense, life is good. It's good to be me. It's good to be in my skin. It's good to, f to breathe, to feel the sunshine, to, to see another person, their eyes. A peak experience. A peak experience is what we were born for. Little children have them all the time. Most of us had them beat out of us to where we think we have to go somewhere, do something, in order to let something count, in order to, to validate that experience is, is its own value, the being values. And when we can be fully present, because the big danger in our culture is multitasking, <laughs> otherwise known as ADD. <laughs> And then we take pride in it. But being fully present, because when you're fully present with whatever you're doing, whether it's just reading a book, or being present to another human being, or, or taking a when you're fully present, then you have access to all your resources. And it takes us out of the instrumental f orientation of life. Instrumental meaning I need to do, achieve, accomplish, and you can just be. And the paradox is that being fully present to whatever, you'll achieve so much more. It's one of the paradoxes of self-actualization. And by doing that, then we'll have those peak performances. Because what's involved in a, if we're going to model and unpack a, a peak performance, is being fully present. So, so the design is self-actualization. The design is is finding, developing, being, being true to yourself. And we've got a lot of leashes that are around us holding us back and different harnesses that prevent us there because many of us have been taught to measure me against you. I'm not as smart as, I'm not as pretty as, I don't have as much money, I don't have, and we may, so I'm not okay with me because I don't measure up to you. Conformity is one of the real dangers of self-actualization. And we live in a, in a society where th just the in, in culturalization process makes us think that there's some model that I need to live up to. And the truth in self-actualization psychology is that the only person to be true to is you. Your values, your beliefs, your experience, what you have to contribute. And when you do that, when you're true to you and, and, and release all the prohibitions and taboos that, prev that wants to keep you in a mold of some sort, that this is the way to be successful, this is the way to, to have love and joy and peace in your life, when you release that and you find your way, you'll have so much to contribute. So part of self-actualization is not only you being everything you can be, but you contributing everything you can contribute. 
Because there is a part of us that likes to feel like I'm contributing. I'm making a difference. And the gifts, the skills that I can develop, find, develop, and cultivate uh, as I contribute them to the welfare, not only myself, but my family, my larger group, and to the world, we, we have a sense of we can make a difference. Maslow envisioned, he envisioned self-actualizing companies and businesses. He visualized self-actualizing uh, groups of people and cultures. And so self-actualization isn't just me looking at my navel all the time and wanting to, to have success in the traditional cultural way, but actually finding out what is this human experience we're all involved in and how can I be at my best, experience everything I can experience, feel everything I can feel, think and imagine all the things I can imagine and give and contribute all that I can give. And then we can say that my life is a life well lived because I've been true to myself. Uh, a quotation that I'd like to start f with this morning as we get started from Maslow, and this is a quotation that um, kind of inspires me for this whole study. If you deliberately plan to be less than you're capable of being, if you deliberately plan to be less than you're capable of being, then I warn you that you will be deeply unhappy for the rest of your life. You'll be evading your own capacities, your own possibilities. Maslow said that there is true guilt and there's false guilt. True guilt is when I violate my own self from being everything I can be and living up to all the highest values, uh, the human values of, of being there. So, so if we don't self-actualize, as we move up the levels through all the lower needs and take care of those, and then move to that place where we start looking for really the meaning of life, the meaning of life above and beyond, having food, having shelter, ha feeling safe enough, having friends, having love, having affection, having a sense that I count, I have some worth and dignity. Once we move to that level, the meaning of life is not all those instrumental lower needs, but now the meaning of life becomes what can I contribute? And what is it about? And we all have this, this sense of searching for truth and love and, and contribution and, and order and beauty and music and all the, what he called the being values. So that's the overview of where we're going to go. And as we go through this, we've got three days to do the three acts of self-actualization. So in your manuals, there are first page that has the unleashing your highest and best. Let me give you an overview of where we're going to go on this journey. Today is the construct, the theater of meaning and self-actualization. Self-actualization involves two dynamics, meaning and performance. We'll look at the quadrants of meaning and performance. If you're, if you're performing something that's not meaningful, life is going to be lived at a pretty low level because our daily bread is meaning, the significance and value and importance of whatever it is that we're doing. So we're going to go into the construct, and today our purpose is, is to unleash in you your creative powers to create meaning. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never walked out my front door, stumbled over a hunk of something and said, who left that meaning there? Can't you pick up your meanings after you... I've never opened my refrigerator and looked in there and said, oh, there's some meanings, and that's not very meaningful. And, and Jessica, would you clean out the refrigerator of all these meanings that you left in here? Because meaning doesn't exist out there. There is no meaning. When we ask the question, what does that mean, and we're not asking it of another human being, we're asking uh, a ridiculous question. It takes a meaning maker with a brain and nervous system, meaning is made inside our neurology and brain. And you're a creator of meaning. You've created all kinds of, you, you came in this room just loaded with meanings. And we're going to explore those meanings, see what kind of creator you've been. And we'll look at the, process, we'll look at the 10 mechanisms by which you create meaning. And as you take ownership of how you create meaning, you have the power 
And it's incredible. You have the power to give anything, almost any meaning you want to give it. So we're going to go into the construct to see how you do that. Take such ownership of it that like Viktor Frankl, if we're, in a, if we're in a Hitler's concentration camp, we could even give that significant meaning so it doesn't traumatize us. Frankl came out of the camp not traumatized. Most people came out traumatized because the meanings they gave to it. Because we feel meaning in our emotions. What are emotions? Neurosemantically, your emotions is the registering in your body semantically of your meanings. Whatever you feel, you created that feeling through the meanings you gave to something. But what? So we're going to explore, we're going to go into the construct, we're going to find out how you're a meaning maker and take ownership of that because then you can say, let there be. And whatever you say, let there be, so be it. <laughs> so, if you, so if you want to have a better life, it can begin today as you take ownership of your meaning making powers. We're going to look at uh, the cognitive distortions, we're going to do some cleaning up of meanings because some people use some really filthy meanings. They awfulize. They, they masturbate. You know about masturbation? <laughs> I must do this. I must do that. Uh, <laughs> they, they just, they're filthy. They're filthy meaning makers. They jump to conclusions. They personalize. And so, the cogn so we're going to clean up our meaning making so that we can do some good, clean meaning making. Meanings that will serve us well. We're going to do a pattern called meaningful to the core. Because the meanings you give to you are going to be central. And if you've given any meaning to you that you're inadequate, you're inferior, you're no good, you're guilty, you're messed up, if you've given meanings to yourself, then your very core has, has, has toxic meanings going on, and it's going to, you're going to feel them. And so we're going to do some cleaning out so that we can become meaningful to the core. And so that's what we're going to do today. Tomorrow's the crucible. Tomorrow is the testing of fire. Today's all about finding our creative powers. Tomorrow we're going to go into the crucible, into the place where we can melt down all of the structures, constructs, things that have formed our lives and that don't serve us well. Creation has two parts. One is to create and one is to destroy. You've got destructive powers, and some things need to be destroyed. So we're going to melt down some of our, our things. We're going to build a crucible. We're going to build a human crucible. First, so that you can have one for you and hold the space to where you can bring into the crucible your needs, your thoughts, your emotions, all the human stuff, your fallibilities. And as you hold that space for you, you can melt down whatever doesn't serve you well. And then you can, out of that, form something new. If you're a coach, if you're a trainer, if you're a parent, if you're a manager, if you're a leader, you can hold the space for someone else and be a crucible so you can invite them to bring anything into it because it's just human stuff. And you can hold it while it all melts down and then they can reform some new transformational choice. So tomorrow is the crucible. Um, tomorrow we'll make sure everybody signs off forms about fire. And <laughs> Because it's going to be very intense, very experiential. Um, it's, it's, it's designed for people with the ego strength to be able to look at and face whatever it is. So that we welcome it into the crucible. Because it's just human stuff. And we don't, if we're afraid of ourselves, if I bring fear and meditate myself with fear, and I'm afraid of my own energies, I'm afraid of my own thoughts, afraid of my own emotions, I put myself at odds with me. Or if I'm angry at that. Or I'm ashamed of that, or I'm embarrassed about that, or guilt myself, or depress myself. So, so we're going to, to change the structure to where I just accept and learn to appreciate whatever I find. And then we'll melt it down. So the crucible is day two, and the crucible, we will, we will build the crucible, and then we'll have probably one example of that for you. And... Once you learn how to build it and use it, and the crucible will be made out of five things, and of course acceptance and, and witnessing will be one, we'll add some more things to that. Then, once we have that, we'll be able to get to the zone. And so day three is the zone, actualizing your best potentials. 
Uh, we'll tap into the work of Chixin Mahali, flow, getting in the flow zone, when the meaning, what challenges us and decides us, is compensated with that other axis of competency, of scale. And then we'll move into the zone where, where the meaning that we want to actualize and make real in our lives will be correspondent to the skills we have to do that. So we'll move into there. We'll, un we'll move and do an unleashing pattern. We'll do some uh, things along that line. And um, maybe if someone needs a swift kick in the attitude, <laughs> we'll do that so that we really welcome problems. Problems are what makes us human. Take problems away from somebody and spoil them with just entitlement. They've got everything they need. And they get really sick. Um, we need problems. Uh, problems is what challenges us to use our potentials and creativity. And so as we change our attitude about problems, that problems are, are is, is the context by which I bring my resources to bear. Throughout this process, I'm going to ask you to pick out one thing to unleash, one thing to actualize. So that if you run one thing through this whole model in these three days, you'll know how the model works then you can run many things you want. So from the very beginning, we want to stop the multitasking and just pick out one thing you would like to unleash. What one thing, if you could just unleash that leash and throw it off, release that shackles, you would have a sense of freedom about that. It might be to unleash your financial uh, genius. It might be to unleash your career uh, genius. It might be your relational uh, skills and powers. It, it may be to unleash your mind to go imagine in a, in a new and wonderful way. It may be to unleash the, the fear of risk so that you'll take some chances. And So we're going to be looking at that here in a few minutes. I'm going to give you a chance to identify something. We'll give you a whole list about things to look at uh, in the unleashing. And that's, that's our theme to, to unleash. And so our whole theme will be to take off those leashes so that we can um, jump up and have a sense of freedom and release to, to live the life that we've been designed to live. So that'll be the theme as we move on. Let me, let me mention a few things about self-actualization as we start so that as to orient us as we move here. On page four in your manuals, the construct, the crucible, and the zone We're always talking about unleashing potentials, and we all have experienced it to some extent. Have you, have you unleashed some of your potentials? We may even need to go through and just, just identify, I've unleashed this, I've unleashed some of this, I've, um, just to have that sense of there's potentials, just latent possibilities waiting to be unleashed. And what have you already unleashed? Most of us have the sense that there's so much more. Do you have that sense? William James is the psychologist at the beginning of the 20th century who said that most of us are probably using about 10% of our brain power, our heart power, our linguistic powers, that there's just so much more. You may want to unleash some of your health potential. I believe that the human body has lots and lots of potential for uh, health and vitality and energy. And some of us have just learned some bad habits that just keep dampening. And, and, and ruining the potential that we have for health and energy. Um, so the question becomes, how can we accelerate the unleashing of our potentials? The second paragraph, if you believe as I do that all of us have so much more potential than we're experiencing and living, and that we're made to, to live meaningful lives that'll make a difference in this world, then the question is that how question, how can we tap into these resources more regularly and consistently? Any, any model of self-development taps into them to some extent. Um, if you've studied TA, if you've studied psychoanalysis, if you've studied behaviorism, if you've studied some of the classical psychological models, or if you've studied some of the more recent uh, models from brief psychotherapy, solution, uh, Ericksonian hypnosis, NLP. NLP is all about tapping into those resources. And so if you've learned some of those models, the question becomes, how do we put all those models together? And I'm going to give you a list of, of some of the mechanisms by which we unleash potential. 
The interesting thing is some of those are so counterintuitive. It's the last thing you would intuitively do given the way most of us have been culturalized. So as we look at those, the question is, how do we tap into these resources more regularly and consistently? If we have this inner drive moving us in the direction of actualizing our best, then, then what would be a method by which we can think about this and, if you're a coach, trainer, lead someone else through the process so that we have a, a tool to know how it works and can do it uh, in, in, a, in a mindful, thoughtful way rather than just a grab bag of, I hope this will work, I hope this will add. I, and, and not really understanding the processes by which the unleashing occurs. So, so we're going to look at the bright side of psychology. At the bottom of page four, you'll see that the human potential movement, I'll talk about that. Because Abraham Maslow was the first modeler of excellence. You know, he picked up on that. Bandler and Grinder began modeling some experts, but, but 40 years before Bandler and Grinder came along, Maslow in the 1930s found two teachers at his university that he was just, he just stood in admiration because he said, they don't seem like people, they're so different. <laughs> he said, they're just satisfied with themselves and, and they, they attend to other people and they bring out the best and, and they're passionate about life and, and there's wows and excitements on their voice constantly and they're old, they're old people, they're 40 years old. <laughs> <laughs> and he said all the tools of psychology, and at that time his tool, sh his tool chest <laughs> was psychoanalysis and behaviorism. And he said all the tools couldn't explain these two people. And so he started taking notes on them. I can just imagine him coming in class and they're lecturing and he's taking notes on them. Because he wanted to understand what made them tick. How why were they that way? How did they keep such aliveness and vitality and energy? Well, Max uh, Wertheimer was one of those people. He was one of the founders of Gestalt psychology at the first of the 20th century. And the other was Ruth Benedict. And she was an anthropologist who, who um, uh, created numerous models in the field of anthropology. And they were just, they were just alive people. He called them self-actualizers because they were actualizing more and more and becoming more and more. And that began the study of, of the best specimens of the human race. And he said, we've been studying the sick ones, the neurotics, the, the psychotics, the people who are traumatized. We've been studying them and thinking that's the model of human nature. And he said, we have sold human nature short. If we want to find out how, how fast can a human being run, we don't take the average of everybody. Averages and statistics are not going to tell us that. We go find the best specimens. And we see what is within human possibility. And he said, so, so in psychology, we find the people who are the healthiest, the most alive, contributing the most, uh, feeling most at ease in their skin, and we mo start to model them. So the materials that, that I've been tapping into are the materials that he spent 35 years of his life modeling, along with Carl Rogers and Roberto Osceoli and Rollo May and many of the others who initiated that movement. And NLP and many other forms of psychology have just been uh, children of that movement. But the movement really lost its way in the 1980s. In fact, several, um, the human, Journal of Humanistic Psychology even said it's, it's over. This third force in the field of psychology, it's over, it's gone. The movement's gone. So as I've gone back to look at that and to find out where did they end and, and what stopped it, my focus has been wh where have they taken it to the edge and what can we now, with everything that's happened in the last 35 years, take it the next step? And so that's where a lot of this material uh, goes. On page five in the middle, you'll see uh, some italics. Self-actualization is the heart and soul of neural semantics. Centrally, because neurosemantics is about meaning and performance, performing meaning and adding meaning to performance. So the threefold focus of neurosemantics. The first focus is whatever is meaningful in your mind, whatever is significant, whatever inspires you, whatever great idea, being able to perform it. Because if you don't, if you know so much more than you do, then that gap is just gaping with the knowing-doing gap. 
and we can get more excited, more knowledgeable, but if we can't translate it into action, so our first focus is let's perform meaning. The second one is sometimes we're performing something. You go to your job, you, you take care of your kids, you interact with your loved ones, but the performances have much to be desired. <laughs> it's not high quality <laughs> performances. You know, 90% of people at work in this country, 90% are dissatisfied. So, so here's a performance, you know, it's Monday, wish Friday would get here. And this is high quality <laughs> performance. So we, what, what we want to do is take, take your performance. If you're the meaning maker, add some rich meanings. Add some robust meaning so that whatever you're doing, if you're washing dishes, you can add such meaning to it that it would become really significant. And you could be really good at washing dishes with quality and excellence and fun and delight and focus. Because one of the ways to waste our lives is to be in, in, um, in, in, in the old uh, complaining, whining state. This is so boring. Why do I have to do this? Every nephew is not fair. That'll bring out your best. <laughs> That'll make your boss want to take you to the next level. <laughs> so we want, to, we want to add some rich meanings to our performances. Most of us wait around until, we find, until meaning comes to us. Instead of taking ownership, I'll give it the meaning, the significance. If you want to be an entrepreneur, if you want to create wealth, you become the creator of meaning because wealth is inside out. That's what leadership and, and entrepreneurship is all about. We create the meaning and we feel the meaning. We let it vibrate inside our neurology and, and then it just starts ebbing out and people will say, can I have some of that? So, so the second focus in neurosemantics is whatever performance you're doing, start wherever you are, quit wanting something else, let this be the first step to that other thing and do the very best you can, so add some rich meanings. Now, because we're already performing meaning, because that's what your neural semantic nature is about, you're performing meaning all the time. Every day you're perform. so the question becomes, what meanings are you performing? What meanings are you performing? Because if you took your behavior and you backed it up to what is the state and what does this mean and how are the representations, the ideas, the beliefs, the values, the understandings, the identity. If you back it up, it comes out of a meaning state of some sort and you're performing that meaning. Does that performance of that meaning enhance your life, empower you as a person? Uh, leave the kind of legacy you want to leave or, or do we need to, to, to suspend that performance? Maybe fire it. You're fired. <laughs> you know, because the performance itself just ha have it now and it's not serving us well. So to identify the performances of meaning and to be able to eliminate that. That's why we go into the crucible with them. To to melt them down into something new and transform it uh, into something new and better. So that's the threefold focus of neural semantics and part of the focus of how we're going to be working with self-actualization. Page eight in your manual gives you another look at self-actualization in these three stages. Self-actualizing is the human adventure. And so we're going to recognize our meaning-making powers, take ownership of them, and then as a creator, construct the reality we want, clear out some of the embodied meanings that no longer serve us, and become a creator of noble and positive meanings. That's, that's what we're going to do today. And as we, as we do this, you can see the little diagram of the pyramid. The pyramid's going to become a volcano. This is the next step in Maslow's work. Maslow gave us the, the pyramid but we're going we're gonna to activate it, energize it, so that out of all the meanings we can create, it's going to become a volcano just heading for the star. So, so we're going to activate, that'll be the energy that tomorrow we'll start activating to, in the fires of creation. 
So that's where we're going to go with things in order to get into that flow zone. Just as a preview, and we'll be coming back to it again and again, page 9 and 10 will give you the self-actualization quadrants. Here's a quotation from Maslow at the top. Self-actualization demands not only B, cognition, that is being, but also D, that is deficiency, cognition. B and D, D is deficiency because the way you experience life, the way you experience your emotions, the way you experience motivation at the lower levels is deficiency. We're not motivated until we have lack. Now I'm hungry. Now I'm thirsty. Now I feel insecure. Now I don't feel loved. Now I don't feel respected. And when you have lack, deficiency, we get motivated. It's an away from motivation. And all of us have experienced, it can create desperateness, a, a dire desperateness. And we can sometimes react and be real reactive when we have that deficiency. Because something is missing and we want it. That's deficiency motivation and deficiency cognition, deficiency thinking. And how many people have those as their glasses they move through the world? They look at what's not, what is not, and, and so they want what's not. But a funny thing happens with deficiency, cognition, and motivation. When you get what you want, the motivation goes away. And so we eat and eat, and then we uh, you know, get the stuff away from it. I don't want to look at it. Or you, you sleep for 12 hours, and you get up, and somebody says, you want to go back to bed? And <laughs> or you've been relaxing in, in a jacuzzi, and you know, the wrinkle thing yeah. starts occurring. <laughs> It's like you want out of there, and you have no motivation, no desire to get back in. Well, the same thing happens not only with the survival and the safety, uh, safety needs, but the, the love and affection and the self-value, the dignity, deficiency. In fact, we're only motivated when we don't have. So being cognition is, is when we shift out of that, and it's a whole new realm of life. And it's being. Now I'm not seeking to do anything I'm doing in order to, but just to be. It's abundance thinking. It's abundance cognition. And, and now I'm operating not from deficiency, but from beingness. It's a whole new place to be. Because now I can really get over myself. This is the difference between the lower needs and the higher. I can now become self-forgetful. And so we transcend the ego. The ego is really driving into those lower needs, the deficiency. And so Maslow says in this uh, quotation, self-actualization not only uh, demands not only the being cognitions, but also the deficiency cognitions as a necessary aspect of it. Because if you don't take care of the lower needs, then you'll keep living there. So we need to take care of them. And, and those of us who become self-actualizing in our orientation, we want to help people to get out of deficiency needs. As long as they live there, deficiency will create competition and conflict and people trying to claim so much of the pie because it's deficient. So this means that conflict and practical decisiveness and choice are necessary, necessarily involved in the concept of self-actualization. It means that self-actualization involves both contemplation and action. So this is the synthesis that we're going to create. Some of you are already great contemplators, creative in your mind, dreamers, and visionaries. And unless you have some action with it, um, you know, you're just dreaming. Great ideas, but no practical. Other people are movers and shakers in the world. They get out there and they make things happen, but they can become workaholics. They can become obsessive compulsives. And, and they can also, you know, while they're very, very effective, it doesn't mean much to them. So they're always looking for the next thing. So we need to combine these two. We need to combine meaning with performance. And that's what these axes are. So you can see the first diagram here, the Y and the X axes. Low meaning, low performance, where we're all born. We don't know what anything means. Can't do anything. Those were the days. <laughs> 
some of us move out uh, toward performance and our performers, we do things, we don't spend that much time thinking, contemplating, imagining about it. Some of us are the dreamers and so we move into high meaning but low performance, others low meaning, high performance, and so quadrant four is going to be where self-actualization occurs and that's what you can see on the next page in the diagram. We're going to put these together. So this is just an overview of the quadrants and where we're aiming. We're aiming for the self-actualization quadrant four, where we synthesize meaning and performance. And you may already have a sense of where you fall into that, that area as you think about that. The next page has a couple more diagrams just to give you a visual image of what we're talking about as we pull meaning and performance together. And this is the flow zone where we're, we're in the zone. And so that's page 11. Day one begins on page 12 in your manuals. <laughs> you can see the menu of what we're going to do. And if there's no meaning, if there's no meaning, then you're going to have to invent it for you, for others. So we need to enter into the matri matrix and the construct to start creating it and to create some really life-enhancing meaning. So on page 13 is your first assignment. So if you get out your pencils, I'd like you to begin writing on page 13. Maybe we'll turn on a little writing music and give you a chance to answer some of these questions here on page 13. Number one is what potentials and possibilities would you want to unleash from within yourself? Is there a book in you that you'd like to write and unleash that? Is there a screenplay? Is there a business you want to create? Is there an investment you want to learn how to handle? Is, is, is there a pr particular profession you want to unleash? Unleash the coach within you. Unleash the trainer within you. Unleash the lover within you. Unleash the parent within you. What are, what are you planning to do that will be your best offering? What do you want to unleash? When it comes to unleashing, you can go through the list of mental things to unleash, emotional things to unleash. So it may be just really expanding your ability to feel, to care, to connect, to be more charming, to be more loving, to be more firm, to be more definite. What emotional responses would you like to unleash? What linguistic? Maybe you'd like to become, unleash some of your hypnotic powers to in, in yeah, to put a spell on people as you tell stories, stories that make them feel more fully them. So linguistic powers, powers of assertiveness, powers of negotiation linguistically. What would you like to unleash? Just doing a brainstorm right now just to think of things to unleash, maybe physical things to unleash. Maybe, maybe that exerciser inside you that needs to come out. <laughs> to unleash your ability to take care of your physical health and well-being. The meditator inside. Unleash your playfulness, your humor. What would you like to unleash? If you're an away from person, question two may be the first one to answer. What do you need to be unleashed from? What's holding you back that's blocking and interfering the unleashing of your potentials? It may be some past memory, some trauma. It could be the way you were parented. It may be some big mistake that you made that you keep playing that B-rated movie in your head and be unleashed from that B-rated movie. It may be some unresourceful state. It may be unleashed from the habit of how you express your grumpiness. So what would you like to be unleashed from? What would you like to be unleashed to? Questions one and two. And, and you can look on someone else's paper and copy if you'd like. <laughs> Unleash the larcenist inside you. <laughs> what would you like to be unleashed from? What would you like to be unleashed to? This part of of self-actualization is catching a vision. Catching a vision. 
Maslow was a college professor all his life out in New Jersey. And after he started developing his model, he would come into his classroom and he was teaching uh, therapists at the postgraduate level. So we're talking 23 year olds up. They were people becoming psychotherapists, psychologists at that time. And he would come into the class of these, these young people and he would say, who here is going to be a next senator of the United States? Mm -hmm. Next prime minister of some country or president? Who's going to be, uh, who's going to write the great American novel? And he would ask these big questions. And he said that the kids would, would kind of have a nervous giggle. This was in the 1960s, that nervous giggle of just, and until he asked this question, if not you, who? Because many of us have not begun to even imagine what is possible. And we hold ourselves down because we're afraid to envision greatness. But if not you, who? Who's going to be the next greatest coach in America? Greatest trainer? And this is where that quotation comes in. If you plan to be less than you're capable of being, he says, I warn you, you shall be unhappy for the rest of your life. So planning to, to tap into some of that greatness. So what would you like to move toward and unleash? What would you like to, to move away from? A number of years ago, I began modeling wealth creation, trying to understand how is it that some people, it looks like money just attracts, uh, is attracted to them. And how do first generation rich uh, millionaires, self-made millionaires, how do they do that? So I started modeling and learning that and learning how wealth is inside out. And I decided I was going to be unleashed from uh, living paycheck to paycheck and bill to bill and unleashed from bill collectors, and I was going to be unleashed to financial independence so that I could choose how I want to live my life. So what do you want to be unleashed from? What do you want to be unleashed to? And because the unleashing just continues every age of our life, we can just unleash from more and unleash to more. So what would you like to be unleashed from? If you've already got a bunch of things on two and th uh, one and two, then what is your dream of the ideal life to, to, to live that fully expresses you? What greatness do you have within yourself to be unleashed? So j before we do number four, if you'll go to page 14, Here's just a checklist of some negative states, meta-states. Self-doubt, self-contempt, fear of disapproval, fear of criticism, fear of change, a lot of the fears, some of the angers, cognitive distortions, we'll go through those today. Negative thinking, over-optimism, wishful thinking, perfectionistic thinking, some habits, some unproductive habits, some cultural factors. So maybe just do a checklist of, well, I, I, th that seems to operate like a leash those of you who have finished page 14, if you'll turn back to page 13, and question four, what is one, the one thing that you'll focus on developing and unleashing in the days of this training? You've got three days to really target one thing that would make a significant difference for you. What is the one thing that you'll focus on developing and unleashing? What is one potential, a strength or a hurt, that you will exclusively focus on what one performance will you, do you want to go to the next level. This will be important if you focus on one thing and learn the model with one thing and not try to apply the model to a dozen different things, but stay with one thing for three days. So pick out something significant. What would make a difference in your life? What would help you be more fully, completely you? What would you like? <coughs> and as you write that down, identify both sides of that propulsion away from and toward. I want to be unleashed from, I want to be unleashed to. I want to take this potential and develop it 
And as it does, it's going to move me away from, it's going to move me toward. There'll be a change from where I am now to where I want to be. As you can see, this is a change model. It's a thoughtful, choiced change model of how I want to take my skills to the next level and tap into something that's a human potential. The nice thing about self-actualization is that I don't have to be the best in the world. I'll just be the best me. So as I stop measuring myself by another person, I'll be the best writer I can be. I'm going to unleash my writing skills. I'm going to unleash my training skills. I'm not going to compare myself to Tony Robbins or, or anybody else, Wayne Dyer. I'm going to compare. I'm going to be the best me. A musician must make music. An artist must paint. A poet must write. What a man can be, he must be. And I think that applies for women, too. <laughs> Maslow was writing back in those times when everything was he. Uh, he must be true to his own nature. This need is what we call self-actualization. Every baby has possibilities for self-actualization, but most get it knocked out of them. I think of the self-actualizing person as not an ordinary person with something added, but rather an ordinary person with nothing taken away. Is, there a, is that a reframe? The average person is a human being dampened and inhibited in his or her powers. An ordinary person with nothing taken away. So that's what we're going for as we look to unleash our potentials. Well, the first stage we're going, does everybody have something written? You shall be punished if you don't. Where are those whips? So the next page begins really the journey, the construct. The construct. It all begins with giving meaning to something. So whatever you've picked, we're, we're going to be layering it with rich, robust, vigorous, inspiring meaning. So, so it means something to us, and it sends messages to our nervous system that will get us moving. So you actualize yourself and your potentials by the meanings you give to things and then the performances that you then execute. It's the synthesis of these two that will put you in the zone. That's top of 15. So we begin with the construct, the place where our mind-body, in our mind-body where we create meanings. And so ultimately, self-actualization is awakened by the realization that we're a meaning maker. And the next paragraph says, meaning as an external thing does not exist. It's an inside job. So we're going to be doing that. So the levels of meaning making. In our diagrams, the spiral is the sign, the symbol for meaning making. And so we're going to start with some NLP. We're going to add the neural semantics to that to identify 10 levels of meaning making. Now, this will be a little technical as we go through the next couple pages. Then we're going to make it really practical. But how do we create meaning? And what is meaning? Well, it comes from a German word, from high German, that means to hold in mind. Whatever you hold in mind, whatever you hold in mind, whatever is on your mind, is your meaning about whatever. So we've always known that. Philosophers, psychologists, uh, parents have always, what's on your mind? What's on your mind? What's in your mind? And we're going to, to pull it out. So you and I have this incredible ability that when something happens out in the world, something happens out there, we can suck it in. We can suck it in and bring it into ourselves. We go to work and someone criticizes us. We go home and we get into an argument. Uh, we, we, we try to deal with our children and they just won't follow the orders. Something happens and we've got the ability to bring that in and in our mind to make a movie. And as we make this movie and play this scene over and over again, we hold it in mind. We represent representational meaning. First of all, selection meaning. What do you select? 
Well, let me see, what shall I select? Uh, you got some crap happen today. Pull it up and play it again. Yep. Step in there and feel really bad. So selective meaning. What are you selecting to? Then we play it. And oftentimes we play it so much that actually we're inside the movie and experiencing the movie all over again. That's basic NLP. The movie in your mind that you represent. This is a power that all of us developed about nine months old. Before that, we didn't have constancy of represent representation. That's why we can play peek a -boo. Because out of sight, out of mind. And we were so simple and innocent. And when, we, when someone, you know, hid behind a paper and, and jumped out, um, we had a cognitive jar. Where'd you come from? <laughs> But about nine months, we hold in mind and take, take our movies with us. Movies of people, movies of events, movies of things. And so we hold it in mind, and it becomes the meaning. So I say any word, and some movie will play. Criticism, betrayal by friend, fifth grade, how many windows on your front of your house or apartment. And movies start popping in our heads because we have, we have an, an arcade of all these movies that we play to make sense and to make meaning of those words. If I said Petros de Prosatus, Metanoisatek, how about Vistito, Costos Hamon? And it's like, what movie is playing? Because <laughs> the words don't connect with the movie. So, so words only make sense if it'll elicit a movie within you. And, and so we, we select, that selective meaning, and then representational meaning, and you've got another power. You've got the power to edit your movies. So, so th think about a, a, a time when you were really impatient and nervous because you didn't know what was going to happen. I don't know what movie you pull out, um, but you pull out some movie about that, and as you step back from that movie, is it in color, is it black and white? Well, do some editing. Make it black and white. Uh, what were you wearing that day? Um, what was the sky that day? And so as you step back and start editing, let's put some circus music into it. And as we start editing, so here's another level of meaning. We can edit our movies. Now, NLP calls that submodalities. As we can edit our movies and start changing them and altering them, and oftentimes, Great transformations can occur by just editing your movies. Uh, just don't have it so close. Have it further away. Put some other sounds into it. Um, and do, doing things like that. So that's editorial meaning. As we do that, we, we language it. So there's linguistic meaning. What do you call that? So if, you, if we start talking about criticism, since you can't see or he'll f feel criticism, and and I say, have you ever been criticized? Have, has, have you ever been criticized by somebody that you thought was really unfair? You pull out that movie and you step back and when was that? How old were you? What were they? Is it in color? Uh, the sound? How loud is the sound? Turn it down. Make it the sexiest tone of voice you can imagine. Um, as we edit the movie, what do you call that? Well, I call that unfairly criticized. Linguistic meaning. Oh, that's what you call it. You don't call it my best friend in grumpy state needing nap. Because <laughs> if you called it that, <laughs> in the beginning is the word. Whatever you say it is, it is to you. So our language is linguistic and holding that in mind. So sometimes we need a tr new transformational grammar in our head to call it new and wonderful different things. There is, there is um, the framing meaning as we set context. Because we don't know what something means unless we know in what context does this apply. So that if, if you're in the pub with your good friend and, and they said the same words as that unfair criticism, in that context, they might just be ribbing you. And it wouldn't mean so much. But when she said it, so meaning is only meaningful in a context and playing with context and frames as we move it around from place to place, time to time. Which is why we can do wonderful things as a therapist, as a, as a coach, as a trainer, 
by, by, by running a, um, a role play with the same thing. Uh, just, but in the context of, let's learn how to handle this now. So if the criticism was, uh, you only think about yourself, you're egotistical, and we might edit that to where you only think about yourself. <laughs> you're so egocentrical. <laughs> and we edit it that way, and that might cause a little shift. But then in the therapy session or the coaching session, we might say, I'm going to say these words, and I want you to notice what happened. Now the context is different. So, so contextual meaning. Associative meaning would be, what emotion are you associating with? Do you like it? Do you don't like it? Is it fun? Is it scary? Is it anger? What emotion do you associate with? If I wanted to know, what does fire mean to you? And the first movie you select from your arcade of movies is a, is a fireplace in a home. On a, on a cold winter night and you're sitting with your loved ones. I bet that the way you edit that will be close and, and warm colors, golden colors, and the language about fires, fireplace, warm home, hearth, friends, and, and the frame is that content and the associ associative motions. But if what you select is house burning down, then the association may be fear and loss and desperation and and out on the street and, and in poverty and you associate it with so many different things. So what does it mean? What does fire mean? It depends on what you select and then all the layers. How you evaluate it. Evaluative meaning. Well, what's your evaluation? It's the worst thing I ever went through. It was fun and delightful. It was just a challenge. What evaluation? We make so many judgments, so many evaluations, using so many different criteria and standards. So evaluative meaning. As we do this, the associative meaning comes down and gets into our very body and becomes our perceptual meaning. This is where metaprograms come in, perceptual meaning. I see it half full. I see it half empty. I see what fits. I see what doesn't fit, matching, mismatching. I see it in the big picture. I see it in the detail. And so perceptual meaning, how do you see it? The, what the glasses that you wear to, to look at that. So on these pages, 16, 17, you'll see the levels of meaning. And we've put out so many uh, metaphorical meaning. What is this like? And linguistic meaning, perceptual meaning, uh, and intentional meaning. So metaphorical meaning, and then intentional meaning. Intentional meaning is, comes up in our English language when I say, what do you mean by doing that? What's your intention? What's your agenda? What's your motive? What's, what are you going for? What do you want? What's your outcome? Intention. Intentional meaning. Because behind whatever we're doing in terms of meaning making, there's some intent that we have. I'm trying, if we're playing a horror movie again, I'm trying to finish this unfinished business. That's my intent. Is it working? <laughs> and so behind all meaning is some intent, some purpose. So as a meaning maker, you have so many ways to make and construct meaning. So the question is, how well do you own those powers and, and utilize that, those powers? I have a little box there just as a summary so that you can quickly just turn to that box and identify that in terms of the meaning making. If you'll turn to page 20, here's an example, just an everyday common example of this meaning making, and how we can now start peeling off the layers, finding the leverage points, and, and working with meaning. Uh, we construct meaning in a great many ways, layer level upon level of meaning as we climb this ladder of meaning, because you can think of this as a ladder, of just layering it to think, to reason, to understand, to select data, to attend to, to represent, to foreground some of it, to background some of it, to label it, to paraphrase it, to evaluate it, to frame it, to make decisions about it, to draw conclusions, develop beliefs about it, value it, disvalue it. All of this is in the process of trying to interpret our world and to construct meaning with it. So here's an example. The customer says, I like the sunny camcorder best. I think that it offers some of the highest quality among the 
choices I've seen in the market. I've been to Radio Shack, Circus City, but I googled camcorders on the internet and there are there's some offers that seem to be a little bit more cutting edge and some of the new innovations that they're offering uh, for a bit more. I, I'll have to make some trade-off. Bob, and reading from the bottom, he hears, I like Sunny Best. He focuses on that, I like Sunny Best. I don't know. You hear what he said? He likes Sunny Best. So he foregrounds Sunny Camera. He labels, this well-informed buyer will go with us. His understanding is Sunny is the winning choice for discerning buyers. His values and beliefs are around good value for price is the winning ticket in this business. He just layered. Uh, Cheryl, she, uh, she hears, others are more cutting edge in innovation. I'll have to make some trade off. She's Her first thought as she foregrounds is the implied problems with Sunny, not innovative enough. Her label is, Sunny is quickly becoming outdated, losing discerning customers. Her understanding is customers mostly want cutting edge products. So at the level of decisions and beliefs and values, we need to, to let decision makers know what's happening on the front line or it will be history. Well, we all know that, um, that, that something happens and we, we can take so many views of it. Well, we take views because we're selecting different things and we're layering different layers and levels of meaning. So your, your meaning ladder, the first thing is to play with whatever you chose on question four. Pick out number four and on both sides of it, what you're being unleashed from, what you're being unleashed to, take a moment just to notice where your brain goes, what's in your mind, what's on your mind, when you hold one thing. First thought that comes when you think about what you want to be unleashed from, first thing that occurs when you think about what you want to be unleashed to, and just notice where it goes because you're beginning to discover how you construct meaning. So use the back, use one of the white sheets on the back and just at the bottom, what do you select? What do you pay attention to? What are you focusing on? Whatever you're focusing on, then how do you represent it? Just use some summary words as you go up your own level. Explore the, the level of meaning. Does everybody understand what the process is? No. So first of all, you'll select some. So who would like to, let me just call this forth from somebody. Who's got something you'd let me call forth your meaning ladder? Whatever it is, whatever it is, these frames are just there, and your mind goes there, OK? Uh, from, I put health, or what I meant by that was bad health. Okay, bad health. Toward success. Okay. When you think of bad health, what picture comes to mind? Um, kind of being bent over and... Uh, okay, bent over. And low energy. Low energy. So if I made him, if I could peek into the feet of your mind, I'd see a bent over person. And, and like the, kind of a moan of uh, like <laughs> Okay, so I got a little soundtrack there. <laughs> okay. Are you in the movie or are you just watching this poor health? Um, when you bring this movie I, in. I, it's real easy for me to be in the movie, so I, I, I'm not So probably your editing is to pull this in. Okay, so we got that. What do you call that? You've called it poor health. What other words come to mind? Low energy. Low energy. That's what this means. Uh, lack of enthusiasm. Lack of enthusiasm. Okay. What is the context? What's your frame of reference? Is it at home? Is it at work? Is it, or is it kind of generally front line? Actually, what I'm seeing is I'm on the beach. The <laughs> beach. <laughs> Again. Well, yeah, who knows? <coughs> 
know, <laughs> brains go in funny places. <laughs> and the thing is just detect it. If, if, you bring, if you bring any judgment to this, you'll just shut down the process. So just finding out, oh, well, that's where it is. You know, just, you know, who needs comedy on TV? Just kind of peek into the brain, <laughs> the theater of your mind. <laughs> Okay, so the beach, right context. Uh, emotions that you associate with that? Uh, uh, sadness. Okay, sadness. Um, regret. Regret. Um, okay. These are different from the emotions of what is being picked out, yeah. the low energy and the moan and the pain. These are emotions about, so they're metastates. So low energy, regret. And, um, and sadness, your evaluation. Well, how are you evaluating all of that? Uh, I definitely have an evaluation that something like it's leading to death. Okay. Like, like it's, something needs to happen here. Okay, so these are the evaluations, uh -huh. the judgments you make. This is going to lead to death, and something needs to happen. Yeah. Okay. So the evaluations. As you look at that, your perception, um, uh, any perception, perceptions that just pop out at you immediately as you think about all of this? Are you looking at this kind of like big picture? Or? Yeah, I mean, since you put that, it's like I can see it. It's like in the picture and with all that, right, all that built up. It, it's like it's over dramatic, and it, it isn't. The actual situation is somehow not. Okay. Not that. So not your your perception is exaggerated. It's, yes, it's, it's over generalized and, and exaggerated and kind of awfulized. Yeah. So it has some drama to it. So 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 that perception. What is all that like? If you had a metaphor, and you could say. This beach and this low energy and this bad health. It's like. What I'm seeing is a cat that is uh, like doesn't have a home or something. It is bedraggled. It's a bedraggled cat. <laughs> bedraggled cat. Homeless bedraggled cat. Yeah. Okay. Your intention. What is the positive intention between representing and holding it in mind like this? Um, my intention is to be healthy. Okay. And to, to be able to have the rest of my life actually. In a way, it's like to have the rest of my life physically match up with kind of like what you said, where my mind is going, so that my physical being could actually be able okay. to go there. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm going to stop right here because I have a couple more questions for you, but I want to do that next after everybody kind of maps out their ladder of meaning. Uh, tell me your name. John Wolf. John. So, John, I'll come back to you in just a moment. So, if everybody will do kind of that thing, that's where all these <laughs> questions of meaning are just asking. And... The problem is never you. It's always the frame. And we're going to catch these meaning frames so that we can deal with whatever is creating the difficulty. And so as you just go explore, what is the meaning? So if you write down just, just a few words just to notice where your ladder goes. If you need someone to ask you these questions, as I just did, turn to the person next to you, and in your manuals you have the questions on the previous pages, that's where all these distinctions have questions, the little um, bullet points like page 16, the first one, uh, what associations do you characteristically make between these things, what evaluations, what's your common metaphors, what's the movie playing in your mind. So if you need someone to ask you the question, just turn the person next to you and ask them if they'll ask you those questions. Um, are you in the movie or out? And if you, well, he said that he felt like he was stepping into it and being inside it. And you can say, if you step out, is it in color? Is it black and white? And it's all those things.